experience of running a, a commercial gallery, how we, uh, how, how the idea came to be and what we uh, had to do in terms of um, research and, and meeting people, the different characters in the art world and how that has helped our business grow and how there's a particular roadmap that you're supposed to follow and how that doesn't necessarily work for everyone. So that's the gist of the presentation. But I'm waiting for my computer to come on. So um, while it's loading, uh, I'll explain um, uh, uh, Gelbi Gelfar. It's, um, it's a German word uh, coined by uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II back in 1895. Whoa, it's happening. Okay, let's go back to the agenda. So just so you guys can see basically what we're going to go over. Um, then I'll go over the roadmap. Then I'll discuss, uh, hasn't responded yet. <laughs> then I'll discuss the risk and rewards of running a gallery. So use this response. <laughs> I think it's waiting to I see it on my screen. Let me see it there. Okay, I see the color wheel. That's, <laughs> that's a good sign. And okay. I don't know. This is this is you're gonna, you're gonna have to win again. I'm gonna have to win again. Yes, I am. Unfortunately. So anyway, um, so uh, Kaiser um, Kaiser Wilhelm II in 1895, he had very anti-Asian uh, feelings. He felt that um, people from the East were coming over to Europe to take over the culture and uh, you know steal your women and your livestock, and so he started uh, an anti-Asian uh, campaign, and he. Uh, coined the word yellow peril and he started he commissioned a painting and so it was it all started because of a painting that was used as a campaign to fight against a different culture a different point of view and so using that mode of thinking um, on a personal level I um, I was educated in the uh, East Coast and so I did not learn anything about um, Asian American uh, discrimination or the plight of Asian, Asian Americans in the U.S. until I went to college. And I met a lot of uh, other Asians who um, were educated on the West Coast. They had the internment camps, they had a lot of uh, history, and so it was very interesting. So th the first time I heard Yellow Peril was in um, a uh, J.D. Salinger book. Uh, a separate piece, and I thought it was really funny. I was thinking, uh, why would yellow be perilous? What, would be, uh, what is so uh, threatening about that? And so taking the notion of having something that's considered negative and making it more positive was sort of one of the ideas behind naming the gallery Yellow Peril. So we would have people uh, from many different generations come to the gallery I think the older generations understood it, but the younger generations, the millennials especially, they didn't quite understand. They couldn't understand why yellow was considered threatening. So it was interesting to start a dialogue with people about the origin of the gallery name and how it suits our vision to have a gallery that's more of a thinking man's gallery where the work in and of itself should ignite conversation and make you not always feel comfortable, but at least have something to discuss after you leave. So that's uh, the origin of, uh, of the gallery name. And uh, I think the slide after that on, if I recall correctly, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, uh, the slide uh, talked about, um, it introduced myself, I'm Vaughn Puthan Subhanasan, I'm the, the director. I uh, don't necessarily have an art background, per se. I um, I'm more from uh, a marketing and a technology background. For, uh, I worked in corporate communications for over 10 years, and I worked in uh, design and technology for another nine on top of that. And um, since uh, 2009, I've been running a uh, 
a social media marketing company uh, based in uh, New York City. And a lot of my clients happen to be artists and other galleries and art spaces. And so through that, and through being a, a lifelong uh, arts appreciator, um, I felt that it was, uh, it was a great opportunity when we moved to Providence to uh, uh, start a gallery. So it all started with Craigslist. So <laughs> we, we had a house um, in, in Westchester. We sold our house and um, the work that we did um, can be done anywhere. So it wasn't, there wasn't a challenge physically. And so uh, on Craigslist, I, I saw um, this space uh, in Onionville. And you know Robert, our, our curator here, he uh, he grew up in he, he grew up in Onyville, sorry, he grew up in Providence. And I mentioned Onyville, and it really scared him because Onyville has a very um, has a bad reputation locally due to poverty and crime. But at the same time, in the art community, it's where Fort Thunder was founded. It's where the Dirt Palace is. So you have a lot of uh, mills in the Onyville neighborhood where a lot of artists. Uh, after they graduate from RISD or Brown, where they live and they create work. And so there was a sense that um, the city needed um, an interesting contemporary art gallery that did not have shows that are salon based. So when we did research for the gallery, we noticed that there were too many galleries showing art on top of art with many different mediums that didn't quite mesh. And there was really not much of a forum for individual artists. So one of the things that we <coughs> set out to do was to create a contemporary art gallery that focused on solo exhibitions. And that way, it's the power of one versus having an insecure artist who needs a peanut gallery to follow them around and clap each time uh, they come up with a brain burp. So uh, anyway, so we noticed that that was lacking in Providence. And so we set out to do that. And so, presentation's not working, but it's in my head. So, one of the things that we, we that you have to do when you, um, I guess, when you when you consider um, opening a gallery is you should um, think about your program, think about the the type of art that you want to show. And so, the best way to do that is through research. And it's not you know looking through art magazines; it's actually going out in the field. And the best way to research we found when we moved to Providence was to um, take advantage of Gallery Night Providence. It's, a, it's a, the third Thursday of every month. There's a bus. It takes you to a set number of galleries. So it's a great way to see the, see the gallery scene. And I know that in New Bedford there's AHA, so that's a great um, opportunity if you guys want to see what the scene is like because what we realized when we went out was that every art scene is different. Like uh, the New York art scene has a very different approach to displaying and marketing. The um, Providence art scene has a very unique way of displaying and marketing, as uh, does uh, New Bedford, I'm sure. So um, we realized that uh, in Providence, when there is a show, it's usually not announced until I'd say one or two weeks before the show, which is problematic, because I learned from you know working in uh, in corporate communications that uh, when you work with with the press, you should have your press release ready at least you know one to two months in advance, and also you have to respect their editorial calendars. Uh, so depending on certain magazines, if you wanted to get uh, an article in Art New England or Art Forum, you know, check out their editorial schedule, see what it is that they're covering for that particular period, and you know, fashion your program around that. So that's something that uh, you should consider when you're working with press. Just always respect their, their deadlines if you are sincerely interested in having a critical look at your artwork, or for your artists especially. So, um, one of the most important things when you're starting out an art gallery in a market that you don't know is you need to make sure you meet the right people. <laughs> so, um, oh wow, is that? You guys can see all the bad stuff on the screen. <laughs> uh, 
uh, you want to make sure that you meet the right people. So um, what's important in terms of networking is you want to um, you know, go to gallery openings, uh, go to open studios when they're scheduled, uh, uh, take advantage of museum talks, and uh, my favorite is uh, stalk. <laughs> you stalk people uh, using social media. For instance, if there's a particular artist or a particular gallery that you admire, there's nothing wrong with stalking them on Facebook to have an understanding of how they conduct themselves publicly, how, um, <laughs> so you wanna be able to be present, you know, be friends with people on, on Facebook, get to understand, get, get, get insight into what the artist does and, uh, And really, you know, take advantage of technology that you have at your fingertips. That way, you can befriend um, collectors and curators and and people in the scene. I think we're gonna get back to uh, the PowerPoint loads. So, it's, it's, so that's something that's very important in terms of of getting to know people. So, I think I'm gonna. I see it. I see it there. I just don't see it where I'm at. So just to dial it back and be a bit more structured, uh, I'll go back uh, to the slide in order and then I'll reiterate a few things if that's okay. So basically, um, I wanted to cover, um, you know, here we go far, the roadmap to starting a gallery, the risks and rewards associated with starting your own gallery. Uh, share some industry bibles, which are, you know, books and things that uh, uh, you could use. Uh, what's uh, going on with us at the moment at the gallery and at the Q&A session? Let's plow through this. Sorry, that's not in the right order. <laughs> anyway, skip that one. Okay, so this is, uh, so I mentioned about German Kaiser Wilhelm II. He commissioned the painting. So it all started because of the painting, and that's what that's what the Kaiser looks like, and here's the painting, which proclaims peoples of Europe protect your most sacred possessions. And so when you're starting an art gallery and you're from a different market, the locals are going to be very cynical. So you need to have a thick skin about that because they'll be very suspicious about, you know, why are you here? What are you doing? You know, who are you to show us what art is? And what are you going to do that's different than what's already in place? So this, these are conversations that you'll have a lot. And so this is us, just quickly, just our background and what we've done. And um, so that's us. <laughs> and Seal Apparel, uh, quick, quickly on the gallery. We found it in September 2011 uh, at the plant. It's a mill complex. We found it on Craigslist. <laughs> and here we are. And here are just some samples of some shows that we've done and uh, some uh, interventions and special projects. Um, our first show, uh, the one on the upper left, was called Borderline. It was about a fence. And so <laughs> it was a show about a fence that, the fence that separates the US from Mexico. And what the artist did was she spent 10 years chronicling the lives of the people that live on both sides of the fence. She worked with Border Patrol. She uh, crossed the fence. She got arrested. She were vigilante. She, she did everything. Very, very interesting project. The second image is a project we did in Bushwick during freeze last year, and it was what we called an installation exhibition. And so these are usually uh, installations that would inhabit our gallery space, and there are about 10 different artists, and so these are 10 different installations, which could, in effect, represent 10 different shows, but all in one space, because we uh, uh, had a cultural partner that we worked with on putting that together. And the third image is, um, just an image of our booth we had at Miami during um, our Bath Miami uh, at Scope, New York. And the image on the far right is from Paul Miyota. He works uh, uh, with Kinetic White Sculptures, and he uh, he's most famous for being the uh, artist that created um, Tribute in Light at the World Trade Center with the two lights shooting up. So if everyone knows Paul Miyota, so for one day a year, he's the world's most famous man. 
and a few other artists we have at the bottom um, that worked in uh, sculpture, video, performance, and, uh, and uh, outdoor uh, work. So just an example of some of the work that we've, uh, we've done. Um, so what's important when you start a gallery is to have a mission. What is it that you're trying to do? And so for us, we wanted to exhibit provocative and visually arresting artwork created specifically to ignite conversations long after users have left the building. Because that's important. If you go to a show and you don't talk about the work, it didn't affect you. We wanted to focus primarily on solo exhibitions because we feel <laughs> the power of one makes the most impact in the career of artists. So you don't want to have your abstract painting put next to a Belgian tapestry and African sculpture. It just does not make sense. But that happens a lot in Providence. And also, uh, one of our missions is to extend the reach of our artists to new audiences, which is very important because I feel that in Providence, a lot of the galleries, they already have a core set of collectors and, and local collectors, and there's already a built-in audience, but all they care about is who's down the street. They don't think about um, extending the reach of their artists to new audiences and, and other people. So they're comfortable with what they have. And when you're new and you don't have anyone, you have to explore other ways to reach people. This is what we've done. Um, and since we're in Olneyville, which is traditionally a uh, 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 up-and-coming neighborhood, uh, we wanted to establish it as a cultural destination for visitors to Providence. So I mentioned earlier that uh, in Providence, Olneyville is considered scary, but only for the locals. So 70% of the people that come to our gallery have to be from out of state. And within Providence itself, 70% of the people are from the east side, which is the more uh, affluent side of town. So for them, it's, it's, um, it's an experience coming to Olneyville. And so having Olneyville as a cultural destination and establishing the neighborhood as a arts district is one of our uh, missions. And so when you have a gallery, you should also have values, which is very important. So people understand where you're coming from and what you're hoping to uh, convey. So for us, it's about having critical dialogue about contemporary art and its impact on society. It's not just decorative art. It's not just something that looks pretty. There's a meaning behind the work. And when there's a meaning behind the work, people can relate to it more. And so for us, social responsibility is a big thing. So giving back to the community. So when we have shows, uh, artists uh, select a nonprofit organization that we donate 10% of all sales to, and each uh, show is a different uh, nonprofit organization that the artists can give to because you know they don't usually have that money. And um, so we, uh, in our business, we try to conduct it with a professional uh, management practice and uh, transparency. And I repeat that. <laughs> and uh, we're very big on inclusion, diversity, and participation. So we want to have dialogue with, um, with the community that we're in. We want to build bridges with, um, with the educational community. You know, we uh, you know, do events with RISD, we work with Brown, we partner with the Athenaeum and the Preservation Society. Whatever it is that you're able to involve the community, it's very important. And that's one of the things that we value because uh, people who are intimidated by art galleries feel that it's just you know art for uh, people that can't afford it, but that's not really what we see. And for us, the pursuit of excellence and integrity and artistic expression and creativities. And uh, we like the engagement of international and local artists because I think if you are a gallery that shows just local artists, it's just a very small circle. And the art making population, the only way to to boost. Um, Art and to give people more insight is to share different points of view. And innovation and originality is always something that, uh, that is important. And so uh, these are our artists. Um, the, we have, uh, there are two things that we do. We have represented artists and we have exhibited artists. And these represented artists, oh, and I think is actually, this is an old presentation, hold on. <laughs> Because I actually had that in figures. So let me do this again, sorry. Uh, yeah, that was not the right presentation because I actually updated that slide. And it had uh, in, in figures, 
some interesting information about our artists that I think you guys would find interesting. Could it be recovered file number one hiding behind that one up top, maybe? Oh, we probably. Yeah, I think so. Oh, I'm gonna be running on reserve battery. <laughs> Let's say this again. I'm gonna slide over. It's like, it's like the presentation I could. Come on. Uh, 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 uh. Leave us. Okay. This is the correct one. Okay. And okay, these are our artists. And so um, we have <laughs> artists that we represent and then artists that we exhibit. And the difference is um, the artists that we represent, we work actively with to promote their body of work. And represented artists are not necessarily artists um, that we represent exclusively. Uh, the issue of representation for us can be based on an exhibition basis or a project basis. So there are certain um, ex uh, represented artists here that we have not given a show to, but we work with uh, on special projects or on fairs, because certain bodies of work um, uh, work work better in, in other markets. And there are certain artists, especially the mid-career artists, uh, who have shown a lot in town or in the vicinity. And for us, working with them by giving them another show in our gallery doesn't necessarily help their career. <laughs> so we try to get them out in other places. And so I put this together, which are uh, our artists in figures, which I thought was very interesting. So of the number here, of the 15 artists, Five are emerging, three are mid-career, six are established, uh, seven have been in biennials, nine have been in museums. We actually have two students, uh, an MBA uh, from RISD and a BFA from Brown. Uh, we have, uh, one of our artists was a reality TV show contestant. <laughs> um, she was eliminated in season two, second episode. Um, <laughs> we have seven Rhode Island artists. We have three international artists, uh, one from the Dominican Republic, one from Berlin, and one from Puerto Rico. And 11 of our 15 artists are also our art instructors. Uh, so they teach at, at Brown or Z or uh, the other colleges. Um, five were born in the 80s, which is interesting that I note that because uh, one of the biggest trends right now in contemporary art is showing artists born in the 80s. And I didn't realize that was a trend. <laughs> And so that, so just to do the age thing. Actually, last uh, September, um, we showed an artist born in the 80s. So we thought we turned that one upside down. It was like in her 80s, thank you. <laughs> and uh, we have an artist uh, that we're currently representing that's over 60. So, so those are just our artists. And so here's the roadmap. So here we go, back on track. So uh, what's important is to explore the local art scene and gather uh, competitive intelligence. And so uh, there's Gallery Night in Providence, and there's, you know, AHA. Uh -huh. So that's a, I, I, uh, I think it's a great introduction. It's a great way to see um, what sells, what doesn't sell, what works for you, what doesn't work for you. And it's a great way to see the local art scene. And so, um, we need to develop contacts in the art world, I mentioned that earlier. So go to openings, artist talks, so there are open studios, take advantage of that. <coughs> go to fundraisers, you never know who you'll meet. You meet collectors, you meet all sorts of people. Cultural events are a great way to meet people and also you know, use social media to uh, keep tabs on everyone. And so um, the next thing is to decide your niche and identify your clientele. So taste obviously varies. Some people here might like traditional arts and people into our contemporary art, some people are into modern. So, um, you know, once you, you decide on your program and, you know, select relevant artists, you know, visit galleries, go to art fairs, and uh, when you do go to um, galleries and art fairs, notice red dots from a commercial level that matters because it lets you know basically what sells and what doesn't. And, you know, think about the different marketing options. So, if you work with an artist and you put together a marketing plan, how do you want to market them? Will you do online advertising? Will you do print media? Um, will you um, engage with the blogging community? It's really uh, up to you what you do there. So the next um, aspect uh, in uh, the roadmap to starting a commercial art gallery is uh, putting together a detailed business plan covering one to five years. This is um, 
the thorny spot of the business because not everyone does it. And um, one of the reasons why a lot of um, art galleries don't do it is if you're trying to get a loan, it's difficult to get a loan when you run an art gallery because it's hard to necessarily quantify the value of art because it's you know, based on what you put together. And so if you're looking to get a loan and when you put together a business plan, you should have like um, a consistent uh, sales record every month. And in this business, you could have like a great month where let's say you make like $15,000, but then three consecutive months after that, you make nothing. So it really varies. And when a bank looks at that, they, they, they don't want to loan you any money. But when you put together a business plan for every one to five years, you think about um, objectives, about what you hope to achieve, because you know quantifying your success should be more than just money. But of course, it takes money to run the business. So that leads us to um, the next slide, which is seek funding sources. <laughs> seek funding. The sources vary depending on your business model. And by that, I mean uh, if you're a commercial art gallery, it's more difficult to get money versus if you're a nonprofit. The nonprofit art sector in Rhode Island is immense. They're just rolling in dough <laughs> because they have more access to money. And as a commercial gallery, you don't, you have your own money. So if you have a trust fund, fantastic. If you don't, uh, you use your retirement savings, like some of us. Uh, your parents, your grandparents, they might have money. Sometimes, you know, hit your siblings, you know. <laughs> that $20 they brought in the eighth grade is now worth $2,000. Um, you have close friends, you know, it, it becomes this weird game where you, you know, you spread the debt around, as that comic says up there. Uh, grants, you bring a nonprofit, bank loans are difficult, as I mentioned, credit cards, and most importantly, have a day job <laughs> because um, it'll take some time for you to build traction in terms of foot traffic and meeting the right people. For instance, um, uh, for us, we, um, it took us, I think it's six months before we met our first serious collector. And by serious collector, I mean like a collector that serves on museum boards and buys artwork and donates it to museums and uh, uh, has, doesn't bat an eye buying something that's you know, four or five figures. And so, um, and also, once you get to a point where you're invited to um, art fairs, uh, which are very expensive to start with, you don't go to your first art fair thinking you're gonna make you know, six figures and you're gonna be like the best thing ever. <laughs> because you have to be more frequent in your, um, visibility, so you have to do more than one art fair. People need to trust you. You'll meet, make a lot of contacts, but the collector that saw you at one fair wants to be sure that you'll still be in business by the time the next fair rolls around. And so uh, the next thing is um, get commitment from artists. I chose this picture because I thought it was very interesting because artists are a very interesting breed. Uh, there's no, you know, there's no box that they all fit in, everyone has a different shape. And so um, as, a, as a gallery, what, uh, uh, what we do is we discuss end goals with, with artists. That's the first thing we do. We ask them, um, where do you want your art career to take you? Do you want to be famous? Do you want to be collected? Do you need more articles written about you? Do you want to be in a museum? Try to understand what it is they're trying to achieve and then do what you can to get them there. And so. We uh, talked to them about what I call the three C's. And the three C's are uh, collectors, uh, curators, and critics. And so what's important with the three C's is um, the curators, I mean the collect, the critics, sorry, the critics, they give uh, your luck, your work, or the work of your artist a critical look that, that a person on the street might not see. And that, in a way, um, allows the collector to feel more confident that their purchase will appreciate over time and also uh, open the door for curators from museums or other institutions to come and consider you for, uh, for their institution. And so those are the things uh, we talk about. Um, and then um, representation versus exhibition. Uh, so not there, you should have opportunities for artists that you focus on a core group of people that you represent, but also you might exhibit people in uh, group shows or 
uh, and other opportunities. Sometimes we get invited to, to show at other galleries and they ask us to guest curate. And so for us, it's an opportunity to bring in a bunch of artists and <coughs> test them in a way that we don't have to in our space. So uh, that's always something. Also set SMART objectives, which is very important when you work with artists. And SMART objectives are um, specific, measurable, um, achievable, uh, realistic, and time-specific. And it's from the corporate world, it's, it's jargon, I know, but it actually really helps because um, you want to make sure that when you do have the discussion about the end goals, that they are reachable. If an artist wants to be in art forum, you want to make sure that you have contacts and you can help them get there. You want to outline that. So when you do schedule shows, you want to schedule them in advance because the artist, you know, every artist has a different work style. And so uh, you must uh, respect that. Uh, devise a marketing plan, which is very important. Uh, do regular studio visits to see if the direction that they're, uh, that they're going suits uh, what you have planned for them. And also you have to respect their hours or habits. You know, some artists, you know, you can't reach until after two in the afternoon because they're sleeping because they're working, you know, at three in the morning. And another thing that's very important that has not been done that much in Providence uh, happens to be consignment agreements. Because when you enter into a relationship with an artist, a lot of it has to do with trust. You want to make sure that when you do uh, work with a gallery as an artist, that the gallery has your best interest. And so the consignment agreement will uh, go over the show, the span of the show, and um, uh, hammer out the business details. And um, that's very important to have because it's all on paper and you know what to expect. Like for us, we, when we work with, the, with, with an artist, we have them sign a consignment agreement for a six month period. So um, we'll have the show and then six months after the show, we do everything in our power to, to sell the work, to uh, you know, we put it online, put it on Artsy, we try to uh, get the artist exhibitions in other spaces outside of the market, and we really you know, make an effort to, to sell their story, their narrative. So it's very important when you work with, uh, with a gallery, if you're an artist, that you have transparency, you know what they're doing. Like there was an artist that we, um, we've worked with before, one of our exhibiting artists, she works with another gallery in town and the gallerist had a uh, furniture design show and had some of her art on the wall without telling her. And that made her really mad because she felt that it cheapened her art. Even though from a decorative perspective, the other artist felt that it was complimentary. But you don't do stuff like that uh, when it comes to best practice without informing the other party. And of course, sharing context is very important because you sit down and figure out who do you know, who do I know, how can we work with each other? And also, you know, seek other opportunities because not every artist, as I mentioned earlier, is an exhibiting artist. You know, we're, we're working with, um, with uh, Joan Bacchus right now, and, which is fantastic. She's you know, internationally known, but her work is too big for our gallery. But we're able to work with her by you know, pro providing for her special projects at art fairs or other uh, areas that would introduce her to a different audience. And I think that's more uh, of, a, of a beneficial or mutually beneficial relationship than one where you just cram someone into your schedule. So really seek other opportunities that best suit the artist and the type of work that they do. So the next thing uh, when you're thinking about starting a gallery is to select the right gallery space. Yes, I mentioned we found ours on Craigslist. <laughs> and that's, it was just, you know, what happened for us. But what's important, as everyone know and uh, knows in the uh, game of real estate, is location. Location, location, location. Make sure your gallery is easy to find, that it's affordable within your means, and that it's suitable for the program. And so what I mean by suitable for the program is, if you're into cutting edge artwork and video work, you don't want a gallery space with windows, you need darkness. So you want to make sure that the space suits the type of work that you want to show. You want to show sculptural work, make sure there's enough room for the sculpture to breathe. You don't want to you know, cram it all together and not give it the uh, space that it needs. Make sure there's adequate lighting, and that's always an issue at galleries, especially when you start out, because uh, lighting is expensive. Uh, make sure you have, there's available parking, you know, signage. It's accessible via foot. Uh, it's close to other businesses, because running an art gallery could be 
um, kind of lonely <laughs> because people don't always come every time you're open. And if there are other businesses nearby, you build up a uh, camaraderie. So when we opened our gallery, we're the only um, uh, commercial art gallery. And since then, um, I think uh, three or four other galleries have opened. So now we all work together and we, you know, share, you know, battle stories and, and collectors. And it's really nice to have that. Uh, make sure you're in a safe neighborhood. Like I mentioned, <laughs> people in Providence think Oneyville is scary and dangerous, but we've had installations where we're, we're wearing Crocs and t-shirts and nobody's you know, shooting us. <laughs> but it's, it's safe to us because you know, we were in New York, so for us, it's, everything's relative, right? Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> and um, make sure there's, it's accessible uh, via public transportation because not everyone drives a car. We had um, an afternoon tea a couple weekends ago at our gallery uh, for our current exhibition. And it was a huge snowstorm, which was uh, somewhat poetic justice because the show uh, centers around a duchess who went to a grand ball and she, and she thought her dress was so beautiful that she didn't want to wear her fur coat, so she froze on her sleigh ride. And so there was this big snowstorm, and I'm like, no one's going to come. But people came. They took the bus. It was amazing. And everyone else that usually is so dependent on cars didn't come. And that was what they had to tell me in emails and Facebook. But that's okay. You know, these other group of 20 or so people took the bus because that's what it's there for. So just make sure there's different ways for people to get to you. The next thing is um, hire trusted employees, and I should add plus interns. <laughs> um, uh, when, uh, trusted employee, uh, this is just from uh, our experience, uh, they're knowledgeable about art, or at least they appreciate art, they might not understand it, uh, have a professional appearance. Uh, they're well connected with artists and collectors because uh, they might know artists and people that, that are in the emerging scene that you don't know. And so it's a great way for them to introduce their uh, network with you. And they also, 